our next session uh, here. Now that, of course, is entitled Future Energy uh, to Fuel a Green Economy, where we ask a, a number of questions, including what does future energy actually look like? I'd like to introduce the session's moderator, journalist and TV host from RBC TV in Russia, Andrew Levchenko. Andrew, thank you. Thank you, Reis. Good day, let me welcome everyone. Let me introduce myself once again. My name is Andrei Levchenko. I am the host with uh, RBK, Russia, Moscow. Let's probably get tra uh, transferred to a different reality if we were talking about war, uh, hostages, terrorism, killings. We will now switch to something different. We will talk about the green economy. Экономики. And we will talk about the power of uh, future energy. Let me introduce the participants that will have the speakers. Natalia Alexeva, the head of UNEP uh, Central Asia, the environmental program here. Yeah. Please, Natalia, oh, let's welcome her. Careful. Rajendra Pachauri, Nobel Peace Prize winner from India, president of the World Forum on Sustainable Development. Let me welcome you once again. Arman Kashkinbek, Director General, the Association of Renewable Energy Kazakhstan. Let's welcome Arman. Please have your seat. Take your seat. And uh, Bill Richardson, uh, former ambassador of the United States to the United Nations and former uh, Secretary of Energy. Welcome, Bill. I would like to start off with the following words. Dariga Nazarbayeva, the doctor of political sciences, on the first page of the forum booklet, had her welcoming remarks. And I liked very much two sentences that I believe could set the tone for our discussion. The world is overloaded with information noise when the facts lose their primary importance, turning into an endless stream of arguments and meanings. Uh, creating a distorted image of the reality. So my request to those of you on stage at the moment, try not to distort the reality. Try to speak facts, numbers, and tr let's see uh, whether we, we can understand what this green economy is all about, who needs it, whether it's about accelerating the economic progress, uh, whether it's an additional burden, first of all, financial burden and economic burden to any state. So I suggest that but at the very start of our discussion, we'll hear from all of the speakers, the panelists, uh, to see how people understand uh, green economy, why we need it, and who needs it. Arman, we'll start with you, because yesterday there was a meeting with the President of the Republic of Kazakhstan, and I believe that this topic was um, discussed very widely. Thank you very much. My understanding is that the green energy is uh, the inevitable future. It will come to replace uh, coal energy, not just here, but everywhere. Yesterday we had the Foreign Investors Council meeting and I attended it and the, mo the uh, locomotive, uh, the driver of the uh, industrial development is the head of the state here and I believe that based on the expo results there will be very interesting programs and government documents adopted and certainly green energy will have a lot of perspective. What does it mean here? Certainly a clear sky over their heads and good health. Okay, Arman, if we are to talk more specifically, uh, do you have green energy in, in Kazakhstan? And if so, could you deliberate uh, a little bit more? What I saw while entering the Congress hall, and mostly you've seen that, that the, 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 uh, the garbage is sorted here. I think that's the first step that we need to do. It's a small step and it's probably not sufficient. So what is green energy, green economy? I would say that green energy is existent. It's a startup, uh, less than 1% according to the results of the previous year, but there are some programs such as the concept uh, to make a transition to the green economy where we have the desired indicators 3% uh, of renewable energies in 2020 and uh, 50 by 2050. And all of the 
those uh, objectives and indicators were supported by the Minister of Energy and the head of the state at the Expo conference, so that the government will make its best to achieve that. Apart from that, we have the largest solar power, power plant in Jabulska Oblast, five, uh, 50 megawatts. And by the way, an agreement was signed during the Expo to uh, double it uh, to have 100 megawatts. And we have very interesting and very uh, uh, promising wind indicate uh, windmills as well the largest in central asia and there is a an agreement signed with the Chinese investors to extend it to uh, take it to 100 and 300 megawatts. And then we have a, a full cycle Astana solar plant close to the expo site belonging to Astana uh, uh, national company Atamprom. There are some other projects uh, as well. And therefore, one could say that green energy exists in Kazakhstan. There's the legal framework and the resources to keep going forward. Okay, thank you. Bill, could you please join us when people talk about green energy, you being the representative of the country that to a certain extent is an innovator in this uh, area, the country that most likely will offer to the market uh, goods, services and uh, related to green energy. What would you tell us? Is it uh, the uh, news of today? Is it uh, for today green economy or it's probably the future, the tomorrow? Well, I believe green energy is, is the future. Uh, solar and wind especially. Uh, why? Uh, if you look at the 200 nations that are part of the United Nations, 198, uh, close to 180 have said their future is green energy. Uh, it's going to take time, but I think in my country, I think you're seeing the price of solar going down enormously, technology improving, uh, wind energy uh, being stronger, a lot of transmission lines. Let me just say, I want to commend uh, the, the, the government and the country of Kazakhstan for combining an energy strategy. You're a major oil and gas producer, that is well known. But I have been very impressed with their commitment to green energy. And Expo, I think, is going to show that uh, 2017, that Kazakhstan is a major player in renewable energy. Okay, I see it. Natalia. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much. I'll probably start off on a more generalized level because uh, this is a session on uh, green economy and desire. I'm a representative of the United Nations Environmental Program. I would say that within the last 10 years, we've been working trying to define what green economy is all about. There are lots of definitions, reports, and papers, but I should say that uh, green economy, from our point of view, is the only option for the uh, Earth to continue its development. When the United States of America declared that they withdraw from the Paris Agreement, uh, President Macron said that we don't have a planet B. And the, in that regard, I would like to say that we're all living on the same planet. And if we want, in this case, for our children and grandchildren to enjoy this planet and to use all of its uh, uh, services, uh, including the environmental ones, we need to switch to the green economy. And when we say green economy, we imply the development that has no environmental risks, that enables us to develop in a sustainable manner using the natural resources without uh, depleting them. And in the latest, in the recent times, we've seen uh, also the word ex inclusive uh, being added to uh, the expression green economy, inclusive green economy. What do we understand uh, by that uh, when we say that? It should be for all of the countries. It shouldn't be seen as something just for the West, because in the previous session we were discussing the West and the East, and we believe that uh, it is necessary for, for both for the Western and Eastern countries, the developing and the developed countries, for all of them to jointly switch to the new renewable energy, green economy, new technologies, because we share the same planet. And there was a, another question during the first session, but we are building walls or bridges. When it comes to the environmental aspects, we are not able to build the walls uh, because it's about climate change. No matter how we, hard we try to build the walls, we share the same climatic system. And when some of the countries make certain efforts, everyone 
still remains in the same boat. And therefore, we need to join our efforts together to build the bridges and to move forward in order to implement the green economy and to understand that this is our planet A, the planet that we share, it's our common planet. I would like to give probably the example of the European Union, as we had Mr. Barroza in the previous uh, session, uh, regarding the circular economy. The circular economy is the closed cycle economy, when there is no waste and all the things that we're used to throwing away, as Andre mentioned, uh, uh, that we sort out uh, the types of garbage here, it's all about our revenues. We can make some money on that and it's all um, recycled. And the European Union is a good example. The circular economy enables you to close the cycle and to minimize the external impact because the resources are finite and we've started discussing the issues related to oil production in particular during the previous session, for instance. The oil is finite, other resources are finite as well, and therefore it is very important to have an idea of our way forward in terms of development, sustainable development, and we need to make sure that we develop in such a way so that our development and economy would be green, which, mean, which means uh, good health to us, good health to our children and our planet. Natalia, I could probably argue with you, and I will probably do that somewhat later, for instance, this uh, statement that we have no other planet. Maybe we should uh, invest the, mo the money into supporting the uh, Martian projects to colonize Mars. And I think that that could be a subject of discussion as well, because not uh, all of the experts would agree with you. Many believe that uh, the green economy should be followed, the principle of the green economy. We will not address the environmental problems. That it's a big exaggeration indeed. And by the way, is it getting warm or getting cold? What is your theory? The climate change. Okay, the climate is changing. So the green economy is not going to have an impact upon the global climate change. The green economy is a burden on the state's budget, and the green economy is the story for the developed, highly developed nations. So that's the subject for the discussion, and, uh, but that would be somewhat late, and I would like to give the floor to Rajenta Pachauri. Uh, please, go ahead. Well, let me at the outset uh, express my gratitude uh, to uh, Her Excellency Dr. Riga Nazarbayeva for inviting me here and for being part of this forum. And uh, Mr. Moderator, I had a brief PowerPoint presentation, but I'm only going to uh, show you a few slides because I'd like to uh, firstly start by disagreeing with you. For you to say that the green economy will have no impact on climate change goes against the very consensus of science, including scientists from your own country. Uh, Dr. Yuri Israel was a dear friend of mine and several others. Uh, and let me just tell you a few facts about climate change which have to be the major driver of changes in the energy sector in the whole world in this particular century. And the sooner we start, the better it would be. Let me first say that climate change and the human influence on it is now a matter which is settled. You might have the leadership of some countries saying that climate change is a hoax, but let me tell you that the work of the IPCC, which I had the privilege of chairing for 13 years. Rajendra, Rajendra, just a second, the leader of which country are you referring to? Well, I'm talking about the US, President Donald Trump. I mean, for him to say climate change is a hoax and base it on what I say is fake uh, news is absolutely ridiculous. It's shocking that the leader of a country which has the highest scientific expertise has to make a statement which really goes back into the 15th century. So uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I find that totally unacceptable. The human influence of the climate system is clear. And the more we disrupt our climate, the more we risk severe, pervasive, pervasive and irreversible impact. And let me talk about irreversible impacts. You know, the average sea level rise, which is based on measurements, since the beginning of the last century up to 2010, has been 19 centimeters. Now, you could say that's nothing to worry about. But the fact is, if you're living in the Maldive Islands or a, 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 an island nation called Kiribati in the Pacific. It's a life-threatening situation because every time you have a storm surge or 
you know, uh, coastal flooding, then you're in a state of fear. The good news is that we have the means by which we can bring about a reduction in the risks associated with the impacts of climate change in the future. And I think that's what we need to exercise. Now, I'll tell you how the concentration of greenhouse gases has grown uh, since the beginning of industrialization. It was at a level of 280 parts per million when industrialization began. Today, it is in excess of 400 parts per million. And where do all those emissions come from? Well, if you look at this picture, the black portion is essentially emissions of carbon dioxide coming from burning of fossil fuels, cement production, and flaring. And the yellow portion is deforestation and land use changes. Now, what we really need to do is to bring about an energy policy and actions by which we make sure that if we want to limit temperature increase to 2 degrees Celsius by the end of this century, as the Paris Agreement has specified, then we have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 40 to 70% in 2050 as compared to 2010. And we, by the end of the century, we'll have to reach net zero or negative emissions. And my submission is that we need to start very soon. The next five to 10 years are going to be crucial in defining how we're going to deal with this problem. I'll skip a few slides and I'll go to this one, which gives you the urgency of the situation. If at the beginning of industrialization, we were to have estimated the quantity of emissions of carbon dioxide that could be permitted to allow temperature increase to go up to two degrees Celsius and not beyond, then we had a budget of 2,900 gigatons of CO2. By 2011, we had used up 1,900 gigatons. The value today would be in excess of maybe 2,000 gigatons. So we have a very small amount of the budget left over. And therefore, there's an urgency, there's a need to take adequate steps. Otherwise, the kinds of actions that would be required subsequently will go totally beyond our reach. Now, what I want to say is, I don't want to go into the details of this, Several renewable energy technologies are already viable. I'll give you a concrete example. In India, for instance, recently there were bids invited for a 750 megawatt photovoltaic facility and a 250 megawatt facility. The cost that was quoted and which has been accepted is less than five cents per kilowatt hour. So that competes effectively with fossil fuel-based energy supply. I also want to mention that, uh, well, I need not go into this, but we have... Java, just a second. Uh, are you claiming that today alternative energy in cost-wise has become comparable with the conventional sources of energy? Is that right? Or is it, does that only happen when the oil price uh, barrel reaches $45 per barrel? But once again, we heard, what if oil costs 100 or $200 tomorrow? as it's uh, volatile. To what extent is the cost of uh, alternative energy is adequate? Can it really replace uh, conventional sources of energy? Absolutely. The only thing we need to worry about is storage technology. And those are evolving because that's a limitation. And that's why I want to give you an example. There are 1.3 billion people in this world who have no access to electricity. Now, if they wait for the grid-based power to come to their homes, three generations will go by. I want to give you an example. Rajendra, I agree with you. You're a Nobel laureate. You're, you're a reputable person. But there is a president of a country, one of the leading uh, major powers in this world, Donald Trump, who claims the Paris Agreement does not meet our principles of economic development. It gets in the way of our industry. And the question immediately is with other countries, Kazakhstan or Russia, then maybe the principles are not so right. How can you speak of modernization if, uh, let me reiterate, a leading power says that the Paris Agreement is incorrect. Can you explain about that? Well, let me say that it was his country which signed the Paris Agreement. 
it was his country and his government that essentially has accepted and is a signatory to all the IPCC reports. And let me also say there is a contradiction. Now President Trump says that he's going to construct a wall between the US and Mexico, which will be photovoltaic panels. I mean, if that's so expensive that it's going to be a burden on his industry, why is he going to do that? And I can guarantee you, five years from now, when U.S. industry feels that the rest of the world has moved ahead, they are going to put pressure on whoever the president is. It may not be Mr. Donald mm -hmm. Trump. They're going to say, you've, you've let us down. So, you know, look at the amount of money the Chinese are spending on building up their renewable energy industry. And this is happening all over the world. So, you know, the writing on the wall is very clear. Why don't we listen to Bill Richardson, uh, former U.S. Uh, Secretary of State. What can you say about this? Well, I, I, I agree with my friend, the Nobel laureate. I mean, the decision of President Trump was political. He was playing to his political base on climate change. Uh, I think the world's most eminent scientists have said it is man-made. Uh, what we have is a very clear scientific situation. Now. What, what I think we need to talk about more in terms of green economy is I'd rather say green jobs because jobs are created in renewable energy, uh, not just on solar and wind, but in innovation. I think the biggest changes in the energy sector have been modernization and innovation, data analytics, automation, uh, a number of other uh, technological advances. I know that uh, shale is sometimes controversial, but horizontal drilling uh, is new. It's reduced the price of oil from $145 to about 50 now. And I know, look, there's a political reality here. Countries like Saudi Arabia, like Russia, you know, when oil production goes down, when there's new innovation, when the world is shifting in new technologies to renewable energy, it affects budgets, I know that. But I think one of the things that we have to be clear is that the energy industry, because energy companies can deliver electricity a lot cheaper now because of this innovation, that that trend is gonna continue. And I think what we need to do is what uh, Kazakhstan has done, is oil producing countries like Russia, like the United Arab Emirates, like uh, Nigeria, like Venezuela, they need to start uh, shifting, not, not entirely, but balancing uh, their energy production or it's gonna adversely affect their budgets and in some cases like Angola, like Nigeria, like Venezuela, uh, the budgets are gonna plummet and there's gonna be real economic dislocation. Bill, you said that the new additional jobs will be created. I heard this number that in the nearest uh, two decades, a, a green economy will create about 60 million jobs. But the main question is, where will those jobs be? That's the question that many ask. Will there again there be leading countries, EU or US? Uh, yes, please. And then Bill, you, if you could answer, but let's start there. There are 1.3 billion people in this world who have no access to electricity. Now, what I did in my institute was to develop solar lanterns, and you train a woman in every village, and you know, these are very poor villages. She has a solar panel on the roof. She charges those lanterns during the daytime and rents them out at night. And the cost of that rental is less than the amount people would have paid for kerosene oil. The number of jobs that are created... Where do you buy, where do you buy solar panels for that project? Where do you buy them? You get them all over now. The Chinese are flooding every country's market with solar panels. So, you know, it's happening everywhere. Even in the U.S., they're importing panels from the, from the chi Chinese. Now, w w I, I think what Governor Richardson has said is absolutely right. And here again, let me mention, President Trump said that he was elected by the residents of Pittsburgh, not Paris. 
I can tell you, Pittsburgh has 13,000 jobs related to renewable energy, far more than what you have related to fossil fuel-based energy supply. Yes, I understood. Bill, please, you and then Natalia. Jobs. Uh, we already heard the words. China, perhaps U.S. as well? Where will those jobs emerge? Will the world just end up buying these technologies from these countries? I think what was the cornerstone of the Paris Agreement was the agreement between the United States and China, the two biggest polluters in the world. And, and I think what you see is not just jobs in solar and wind, but in insulation, in, uh, in finding ways that vehicles are more uh, fuel efficient, in uh, transmission, uh, across the board, in, in appliances. Uh, the, the very nice Nobel Prize winner commended me when I was Secretary of Energy. I made refrigerators more efficient, uh, not just solar panels. But by, by the way, the, sol the price of solar panels has plummeted. And just think, Germany years ago was a nuclear country. It still is. But 30% of Germany is now renewable. So the shift can happen very rapidly. And these are jobs that are being created in this renewable energy industry. I agree that by 2020, Sweden claimed that it will stop using uh, uh, oil, uh, will become an oil free country. Uh, on, to, question to you, Herman. How do you incentivize development? Most likely, uh, uh, there are opponents of your direction. There are conventional. There's conventional energy. There are businessmen who feel quite nice by producing oil and selling it. Uh, when you come with your projects and start telling them about some green energy, uh, energy of the future, that's something that you can't touch with your hands and you can't make much money on it right away, do you face that problem? How do you accelerate things? What, what, where are the mechanisms? You are right. I wouldn't say it's a problem. Uh, it's, it's not only for your country, it's for everyone. No, it's a discussion happening everywhere in Kazakhstan and Russia. Our energy mix, what it will look like in 10, 20 or 30 years from now. And we're not only trying to find a common uh, uh, language with uh, metallurgical mining uh, oil companies uh, uh, operating here in Kazakhstan, uh, but uh, we're giving incentives. Uh, by law, they have incentives to develop new RES uh, for their own needs, uh, for their own energy consumption. But on the other hand, there will be no uh, obstacles for them to develop other projects in the country. And now, early colleagues said, jobs. Uh, how things are developing, Trump, uh, are, yes, but I think Kazakhstan is looking more to the, its neighbors, Russia, China, uh, a little bit in the Gulf countries, uh, well, uh, in Central Asia, not everyone is actively investing in uh, RES, but uh, uh, China is very active, Russia is uh, already on that path. Kazakhstan is only in the beginning, maybe we did some things right, but look, uh, Germany is 30% RES, China, uh, look at the US uh, with their solar uh, programs under Barack Obama. We started slowly by studying international experience and applying best technologies available to develop our own industry. We believe we can also avoid the mistakes made by others. Green energy, we should be honest, in some countries it suffered uh, failure. Well, not a failure, but it led to problems with grids. In countries like Spain, uh, what happened there? Uh, they were accelerating their development of green energy that existing capacity uh, uh, simply couldn't catch up with the development of uh, new technology. Same happened in China. I believe last year in summer they had a uh, slight reduction in the level of development uh, of uh, capacities in uh, green energy. Uh, thank you. Natalia, you wanted uh, to step into the discussion. Yes, I'd like to say it's not only for major countries uh, like uh, US, China, Russia, but uh, in the market we're all developing in implementation of new technologies and development. I believe uh, in, uh, colleagues, we have colleagues in Uzbekistan and they started manufacturing solar panels in Uzbekistan as well. And I must say that last week, exactly in the framework of the ministerial conference uh, on sustainable energy, it was announced 
that Kazakhstan is opening a center of green technology and green investment here in the premises of Expo. So I think we should show that there are mechanisms of transfer of technologies and implementation is not only in the hands of major countries that play these games, so to say. Natalia, but you said play these games. Why? Just uh, is that uh, to sound uh, nice or do you still believe that it's still uh, a game of some sort and a game with, uh, uh, with whose re results you can't really be confident in? And there are some experts saying that's a kind of arms race, green uh, technology race, uh, and you don't know what's uh, behind the finish line. Currently, the situation, uh, whether the situation will improve, I'm not going to argue whether uh, the, the environmental aspects will be getting gains. What will we say? Well, you know, it's my opinion that in any event, if we apply new technologies, if we uh, use safer technologies, it's uh, in our interest anyway, and the results would be more uh, optimal for both us and our neighbors. Why do they say games? Uh, yes, because truly we don't see linear process here. When the country, and we were discussing from the U.S. perspective uh, a minute earlier, at some point it will happen that development is linear and then uh, there are drops and then it may go back to the same trajectory so in, uh, that's why i used uh, yes it's not always uh, that governments uh, uh, that promote this process things are not very linear and not all international treaties are being uh, uh, honored fully yes and so i'd like to add uh, now tap the audience yes please raise your hands uh, who believes uh, today that green economy is already a reality, that it's present now, or is that something of the future? Those who believe that it's already in our lives, green economy. One third? No, a quarter. Just a quarter of the audience believes that green economy is already here. Yes, I saw your hand. Just a quarter. So it's probably economy of the future. Maybe someone will ask the question to the uh, by uh, taking a position uh, to the panelists from the audience. Uh, yes, uh, colleagues from Uzbekistan uh, were nodding uh, when uh, they started speaking of production of solar panels in Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan and green energy. Uh, I'd like to address you. Yes. Uh, would you please? What's the attitude? And uh, just curious, if you could please deliver a microphone there. Uh, second row there. Thank you. When you say. Uh, I see more oil and gas in Kazakhstan, uh, small population, vast territories, so there may be doubts. Uzbekistan is six times smaller than Kazakhstan in land mass and has population in the order of about 33 million people. Uh, by 2030, uh, forecasts say there may be over 50 million of us and live, and people live in remote areas uh, in a very dense manner. But uh, given that we're uh, number eight in the world when it comes to gas production, it's just unrealistic to use just pipelines uh, that are becoming obsolete. Uh, it's simply your gas becomes uh, unviable. So uh, Uzbekistan is actively working on RES. In Uzbekistan, we have 365 days. Well, 320 days in 365 that days are sunny. So how much do you produce uh, with sun, uh, with solar, uh, wind? Do you have uh, numbers? I don't have the exact numbers, but I know that recently there is an obvious trend uh, in Uzbekistan that in these remote areas, uh, especially in mountainous areas, where uh, there's good sun, uh, uh, they'll be installing solar panels and and new other technologies are being introduced that will help us uh, not to export, j just export gas, uh, which give us what, about 120 million uh, dollars a year. But if we do uh, petrochemistry or gas chemistry, rather, it will give us about 1.5 billion in profit. So we're, we're not just to export uh, gas or just burn it in an incinerator, no. But we should go into processing our gas, thereby creating new jobs, developing new technologies and improving people's living standards. I understand, but it's more about upgrades. But regarding the renewable energy share, uh, some of the BP numbers uh, during the recent uh, survey that they've obtained. So, 
uh, consumption 33% of all globally, gas 28, hydropower 34, nuclear energy 7%, coal 5, and the topic of our show today, sorry, of our forum today is renewable energy 3.2%. Arman, you see 3.2% the global consumption of renewable energy. In other words, there is some potential to grow, however, oil and gas are overwhelming, over 60%. That's exactly so, and based on what we've heard from our colleague from Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan are united through the existing uh, energy projects, so Turkmenistan, China. Uh, pipeline. This was again uh, a joint project uh, with the compressor station. So the neighboring countries will certainly get together if it's economically beneficial to them. We have no other neighbors. Same thing for the renewable uh, energy. In fact, Uzbekistan is an ancient, uh, very sunny country, and certainly I would say God blessed one with solar resources, with gas generation as a basis. Who is supposed to develop it, Arman? Then businesses, how could they be get interested? Because it's uh, an additional burden for them. Where are they going to get that money from? Because they need to address uh, their daily issues. Where can they get the money from to pay salaries or, uh, or to buy the equipment? And you're telling me about the future of the green energy and I have no money uh, for tomorrow. I don't know how to handle it. I don't know if we have businessmen in, in the audience, uh, but I don't know if they have spared million, millions or billions to invest into that. Well, based on your statistics or the BP statistics, uh, no one is trying to tell that, to say that uh, tomorrow, the day after, uh, renewable energies will be less expensive. The reason why they would ask questions about uh, that in the US and in Europe. Uh, Mr. Pachori said that now the, the uh, expenses or the, the cost effectiveness is almost the same because in fact, uh, in those countries, people people pay uh, uh, the fair price uh, for, for that energy. In Russia, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, this, low, uh, this price is very low and it's uh, uh, certainly supported by the state. And that's why the head of the state said that we need to stop subsidies into the traditional conventional energies to become so that the renewable energies would be competitive. Uh, just a second, Dermot. So we need to shift the burden of financial uh, the financial burden to citizens. I didn't quite get it. But let me jump in over here. Yes, please, where can we get the money from for business development and green economy development? Most likely the United States have the money or has the money or Germany has the money. Where can Russia and Kazakhstan get it from? Mr. Moderator, I was trying to tell you that even in a poor country like India, several countries of Africa, there is a major shift towards renewable energy, the use of solar energy. And you didn't let me finish. What I want to tell you is the solar lanterns using so solar power are far cheaper than using kerosene, and it transforms their lives. Poor people can transform their lives by getting clean, efficient, and low-cost lighting in their homes. Otherwise, when the sun goes down, they have darkness. I also want to emphasize the fact that given the fact that I gave you numbers, the cost of power supply from photovoltaics, and I'm giving you actual projects, is so much lower that business is going to invest in them. The financial institutions are investing in them. So you know, the 3.2% that you mentioned may be the situation today, but it's going to change. We have to look at the future. We're now talking about future energy. And I want to tell you, in the case of BP, when Lord John Brown was the CEO, he, you might remember, he had full-page ads saying British Petroleum, BP stands for Beyond Petroleum. And that company was investing heavily in renewables. Of course, there was a change in leadership, and you had a conservative approach being adopted. But there are lots of CEOs today who are now looking at the future. You probably just read the story about Exxon Mobil and Shell getting together and suggesting a $40 uh, per barrel, uh, $40 per uh, ton of uh, tax on carbon dioxide internally, which they said can then be given as social security. Mm. So if Exxon Mobil and Shell are talking this language, they see the writing on the wall. So things are going to change. And let's look at the future. 
just because it's 3.2 percent today doesn't mean that it's not going to grow exponentially in the future. It will. Да, господин Пачури, спасибо, Бил. Yeah, Mr. Pachuri, Bill, please well, join I, us. Well, no, I, what I wanted to say was, usually, you know, I know you you uh, you emphasize that statistic, but usually, if you look at clean energy, natural gas and renewables are coupled together, and those are growing exponentially. Now, um, you know, in the United States, the shale revolution has caused uh, oil prices to drop, horizontal drilling, uh, the new technologies there. I think shale is good, but what I want to make sure is, you know, a lot of the energy companies, they're probably represented here, they don't want any kind of regulation, but they should have regulation, because there are some methane uh, that is caused, they should disclose their chemicals. Uh, I think it's important that in new discoveries of natural gas, a new technology, as I mentioned, the horizontal drilling, the fracking, that there are potential environmental problems. And I think since you're talking about winners and losers, I mean, let's face it, I, uh, in my state of New Mexico, we used to have a lot of coal jobs. Coal is diminishing, uh, not just because of climate change, but because of the new technologies of natural gas. Nuclear is diminishing, although nuclear does not emit any uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but it's got other problems. What do you do with the waste, the cost of nuclear power plants? I think you're seeing this worldwide, uh, not necessarily winners and losers happening dramatically, but a shift towards natural gas and renewables uh, over fossil fuels. And I think countries need to adjust. Uh, and I think President Obama had a good policy. It, it was sort of all of the above with an emphasis on renewables and natural gas. Um, and, and so I, I just wanted to make that point. Yeah, Bill, but could you answer the question? Who is supposed to provide funding for all of those changes? Who will finance the green energy and the green economy? Based on what you are saying, it's the oil companies. It's a paradoxal thing. Green economy and oil companies. So it looks like uh, they will go ahead and they will give their money for this development. I mean, look, for years around the globe, fossil fuels had government subsidies, so did coal, so did nuclear, so should renewables. Uh, why is it that in Europe you have seen a dramatic uh, investment in renewables by the European Union? Almost every country has these subsidies. I think you need a combination of private and public sector funds. That makes sense. This is how innovation and jobs are created. There's nothing wrong with that. Thank you, Natalia. Can I add something to that? Sorry, I can, I can see three hands. Let's hear from Natalia first and then we'll hear from the audience. What we have seen um, discussed very actively with regards to green investments, that's what I wanted to go to. During the meeting with the foreign investors, the president of Kazakhstan raised this. I liked his words a lot about uh, funding for the green economy, for the green uh, energy. Well, I should like to, to tell you that subsidies and funding from the state play a significant role. It's not about the private sector only that would invest into green economy and some changes. No, no. Natalia, your focus, your emphasis is not that right. How can we make the businesses invest into it, not the state? That's the major thing. So that it would be interesting to businesses so that Arman in his meetings wouldn't be having fights all the time with the representatives from the convention companies who treat anything related to, to green energy as an additional tax and an additional headache. They don't want this green economy uh, in their day-to-day -day life. Well, I would say it's about the mindset shift. As mentioned, I was mentioned at the Astana Economic Forum on Friday, they had some sessions on green investments and green economy, and there were some Russian companies, Crayon and Lukoil. Lukoil uh, presented some of the experiences with solar stations, and uh, they do not operate in Russia, unfortunately, but in the European Union. Isn't it strange? An oil company going for green economy. I think it's 
looking into the future, they realize that it's better for them to diversify now and not to uh, start to get on the train um, when it's already gone, but try to do it uh, in a timely way. And Creon said that they are opening a new fund to finance the new energy technologies, to see what kind of technologies are out there to be pioneers and to promote them. It's pretty profitable to many of those companies. Okay, let's thank um, Bill Richardson for his participation in the session, because Bill is supposed to attend the press conference, I was told, and I was supposed to let you go now, right? He looks surprised, but that's the way it is. Let's thank Bill. Bill, thank you. And now I suggest that we hear from the audience. Please go ahead. The lady over here, or, or you, yeah, okay. Make sure you introduce Shuzot Butaran Kashaev, International Press Club Uzbekistan. I think that we should be talking about the partnership of the public sector and the private sector. Are you talking about the money? Yes, because you were asking about that. The 3% has not yet turned into a trend, the trend that we would like it to be. And uh, while people have this cheap gas, you, you suggest that we cut off the gas? No. It, we need to deplete it, I don't know, or it should become very expensive. expensive. People are practical in terms of selecting um, the things that they pay for. And therefore, I think that the state, the public sector, would uh, could work with the banks or financial institutions, could provide certain preferences to them, and they would fund it. And what, uh, just a second, the banks, why would the banks fund green projects? Why would they invest into long-term projects uh, uh, with questionable re uh, returns as opposed to having an oil man coming to them, give me some money for one year, I will make a return and repay very quickly. Or are you talking about some specialized banks? I'm talking about uh, uh, public, uh, public banks, for instance, who would invest money into solar panel manufacturing, for instance, and they will give two or three years loans, and that will stimulate uh, production jobs, and that will create new trends. Internet was not uh, very well spread before. Well, do you have a question, or are you just making a comment? It's a comment. Okay, we have some other hands. Please introduce yourself. Uh, I, I then identify who you are, though everyone knows who you are. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, you know, my question is that uh, right now in the world, uh, the uh, Americans are uh, producing per capita the highest carbon dioxide em emission, twice as per capita as China. So, and of course, in U.S., um, I, I, it's terrible that Bill is not here, the 50% of the food that is bought in the supermarkets end up in the garbage. Now, as Pope Francis stated, we have to reduce consumption. That is the easiest and fastest way of uh, bringing down this pollution of the world. Why should we, as a human being, and nobody really, I've been in decisions of the, like this for so many years. Nobody really, uh, of course they might be afraid of a corporation that would hit them hard, but reduce the, cons the consumption. Why do we have to have 100 ties? How many, why should we have 40 pairs of shoes? Why should we have, the, you know, this, this the, 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 the creates problem because consumption uses a lot of materials and that material, of course, creates pollution, but that's a reality. Nobody talks about Прекрасный вопрос. Прекрасный вопрос. А можно вам тоже вопрос? That's a wonderful question. Can I ask you a question, please? Have you started with yourself? Have you reduced the number of ties and suits that you are wearing? Absolutely, I have. I had the white ties. I made them narrow. I had a very long suit. I <laughs> cut them short. The, you know, it's, it's really, if you think about it, it's so easy to do this. But we have to talk about it so we will wake up. Otherwise, this world is this 
it is going to be destroyed when the population will be going to uh, nine billion soon. So I think we have to be more uh, intelligent, uh, and it's cheaper than all these investments that we're talking about in green energy, in wind energy. No, we have to do that. However, this is much cheaper Прекрасный and much faster. This is wonderful. Why don't we hear from our speakers, you know, Mr. Pachun? This, this is absolutely right. We have become an extremely wasteful society. My good friend Tom Friedman of the New York Times rightly says that the problem with the world is there are too many Americans. And what he says is everybody wants to live <laughs> like an American. We are extremely wasteful. And you rightly said, sir, 50% of food that's produced is wasted. In the IPCC fifth assessment report, we have clearly said that there is a need for bringing about lifestyle changes. And this includes even dietary changes. One of the things I've been telling audiences everywhere in the world is please eat less meat, you'll be healthier and so would the planet. You suggest that we shut down McDonald's and K or KFC? I'm not saying that, I'm saying an average American eats 271 pounds of meat per year. And everyone would be healthier, and so would the planet if you ate less meat. I'm just saying this is part of a change in lifestyles. We are extremely wasteful. But, and, you know, we, we, sure. we buy... It, it's right it's right. Those are the right words, but then the question is that the people need, need to start wanting to do it. If you come and tell me, well, not, not even me, but anyone, go ahead and consume less, that's not enough. We need to have some incentives, economic incentives or social. And one of the things that you also need is disincentives. If you're damaging planet Earth, then surely there should be a cost attached to that. You know, the whole concept of a carbon tax essentially rests on the fact that you're imposing some externalities that are not being paid for. So you need incentives, you also need education. You need to educate people. People are intelligent enough to take the right uh, decisions and make choices. And I think particularly with youth, you need to make a beginning by telling them that this lifestyle will require maybe two or three uh, planets. Uh, Mr. Pachuri, do you believe in that? Do you really think? It seems to me that it's the hardest thing, changing anyone, changing the human being, the habits, or the, the, the wishes. You can change the tax system or build a new road, but the mindset, the things that they have in heads will probably be long-lasting. Do you believe that it's possible to do this? Absolutely. Absolutely. It is entirely possible to do it. It's happened in the past. After all, you gave the example of oil. The Stone Age didn't end because there were no stones left. It's just that people realized that there were better options. And one of the better options we have is renewable sources of energy, which are clean, which will also clean up the air in Beijing and Delhi and Mexico City and everywhere else in the world. So Thank there's you. enormous co-benefit. Natalia, uh, yeah, Natalia, please, I will add on to that. From the point of view of production and consumption, indeed, there are certain papers on sustainable consumption. Sustainable consumption, this uh, concept exists, and it's uh, under discussion. And again, we need to talk about the motivation. We should understand that we have no other choice, because they garbage uh, lands, uh, landfills, one of them which was opened uh, uh, at 6 a.m. today. For those of you who don't know, after the uh, direct line with the president, the governor uh, in the Moscow region uh, asked for two years to close up the landfill, but then he didn't like it and they were able to do it within one day. Uh, what did they do with the, with the waste? Well, they, they will recycle them, okay. So apart from that, it's important to remember about the corporate social responsibility. When you asked about the businesses, why would they pay for it? Because Businesses have their own responsibilities as well. Yeah, Natalia, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It does. The responsibility, it's about words. Businesses think in other ways. Arman, you can um, uh, comment on this. You are a business person. If you talk to businesses about responsibility, those are good words. I'm not against those words. I am in favor of responsibility, social responsibility, other types of responsibility. But businesses think about money, whether it's profitable or not. What am I going to 
to get out of it? Who will get the money, uh, give them the money for this? Who will reduce my taxes? Isn't it true? I would like to add on to that, uh, responding to the question of the best friend of Kazakhstan, Mr. Bijan. We know him. Uh, he was the one asking the question. I can uh, confirm that he started with himself. He's been wearing this tie for many years. It's the same tie. Uh, but he's very right. The green economy uh, is not a panacea. Uh, it's not uh, falling from the sky somewhere. We need to start with ourselves, with energy saving technologies. Uh, or it's about oil, gas, uh, uh, coal, and the consumption of households to make sure that uh, we don't use our window uh, in the house to regulate temperature. We all go to Europe, uh, the United Kingdom, America, they have like this, uh, uh, their specific uh, way to regulate, uh, they, 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 they put their pullover on and they don't heat up their uh, homes so much. Within the uh, Soviet uh, Union times, we, we got used to living at the expense of the state. I agree that it's hard to change the old generation. All our hopes lay with the younger people. We need to explain the advantage of green economy so that it would help uh, uh, them work with the population and the younger people. If the younger people understand it and they start transforming themselves, then everything will change. What Mr. Pichuri said will work. Uh, Ambassador Richardson mentioned a very important word when he talks about the investment into the and where you're going to get the money invested in the green uh, uh, technology. He used the words revolution. Regulations of banks and uh, IPPs, which the energy providing companies, which created a corrupt environment, which means they're taking money off those poor countries like Pakistan and putting them into tax-free safe havens, which I mentioned earlier on. So we need an ethical economic policy to achieve all the objectives we have. Otherwise, it just become a forum and a talking shop. So the greater regulations, greater accountability of those BP or Shell, and remember that water, oil, and other gas are free. They are natural resources. They're not to be profited. And this mentality of getting profit of everything is the main problem. Now, coming back to the, my gentleman from India, he's talking about uh, uh, Americans should eat uh, less meat. India is the uh, highest or one of the leading meat exporting countries. And they are not only that, they're mostly killing Muslims as well for eating beef. But they are, they, are, they are a higher number in uh, uh, beef exporting. So I think it's important that we keep, keep a balance of the environment of how people are living and where they're living. Thanks. Please. Over there and then lady there. I believe I agree as well with many... Please introduce yourself first. I'm the ambassador of Lebanon to Kazakhstan. So I believe with many scientists who say that the future will not have any lack of energy because of the new technologies, new techniques being introduced. Now we're seeing the plasma cell, the European project on the fusion, etc. So the, what will be affect most is the cost of the energy. But now I'd like to a bit, uh, my friend Bijan uh, talked before me, but I want to compliment his suggestion on human behavior, which is controlling reproduction. Uh, after a few decades, three decades later, we know that during, uh, as to the simulation, the world population would reach eight million. It was seven billion, sorry, eight billion. It was seven billion a few years ago, looking within three, four decades, growing by one billion and especially we're talking about China and India, and we know that the population of India will oversee the population of China till 2050. So we're talking, talking about green energy, green economy. So why not to try control the growth of human population? By controlling this, by controlling, like China did and succeeded, but controlling this will be consuming much less and uh, emitting less gases, we will be using less natural resources, and cost will be more controllable. Because more population, I know more expenditures, more expenditures, more people, more consumption of clean energy. Thank you. Uh, uh, that's cool. 
So controlling uh, reproductive behaviors, uh, uh, Mr. Pachuri or Natalia, would you comment on this? I, I think it's an extreme suggestion. Yeah, I think what you really need to understand is a colleague of uh, Governor Bill Richardson at an event which I had organized said that the U.S. has a population problem. He says because every American consumes 40 times what a Bangladeshi com consumes. So he says we add 3 mil million each year, so we are adding actually effectively 120. But I agree, population has to be regulated, and the only way to do that is to educate the girl child. Give the example of India. In India, there are parts of India where you reach a net reproduction rate. And that's because girls have been educated over there. They make the right choices in terms of their fertility behavior. I don't think you can repeat what China has been able to achieve. They've followed different methods. They have a different system of government. But I agree, we have to worry about population. It's not going to be 8 billion. It's going to stabilize at 9.5 or 10 billion. So it's something to worry about. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Uh, uh, Nick Fielding from The, uh, from the Guardian. Um, we all know about climate change deniers, but I'm quite surprised to find so many renewable deniers in this room. It's really quite surprising to me. You talked a figure about 3% as being the amount in the world that's uh, renewable. I come from cold Britain, right? Three weeks ago, we generated more than 50% of all our power from renewables. So please do not talk about these tiny figures. If a country like Britain, which gets, I mean, you, you, you talked about 300 or something uh, hot days or, or warm days a year, we probably get about 30. But we can produce 50% already. And that's before, uh, and I think France produces something like 30% also from its renewables. People need to get real. China has already said that by 2030, every car in the country will be electric. Tesla is building a massive battery plant in California, which is going to make sure that most cars in America very soon will have to be electric. These things are happening right in front of us. So there's no point in denying what is actually happening in front of us. Around where I live, in England, farmers are not only planting crops, they're planting solar panels in England. You see fields and fields of them. Everywhere in Europe, in large parts of Europe now, you're seeing more and more fields being planted with solar panels. And these are in countries which don't necessarily get the massive number, the massive number of days of um, clear days that you would see somewhere like in the Middle East, for example. So the real, the real question here is not about who's going to pay for this. This can all be paid for. It pays for itself. It's about taking the decisions to do it. That's the main issue. You started with comment with saying uh, which country you come from. Uh, let's make a difference there. England is England, highly developed nation. <laughs> it's a bit. So the question was asked, where would other countries source money to uh, to, ins to, s to install solar panels and use RES? 3% of renewable energy is based on study by BP. Yeah, yeah, but let, let, let me come in here. I'm sorry, I have to intervene over here. India has plans to set up 175 gigawatts of renewable-based capacity by 2022. It's happening. And I gave you numbers just now about these bids which we have received. You know, less than five cents per kilowatt hour. It's happening. And I'm so happy that our colleague from Guardian has spoken up. Because let's open our eyes. Let's find out what's happening. Let's see where the future is going. Let's forget fossil fuels. We are going to have to move away from them. The writing on the wall is very clear. And I think we have to accept it and support it. If we don't do it, then I think climate change. Mr. Pachuri, everyone votes with both hands. No one's, no one's denying. The question is how do we incentivize business? How do we make sure that the funds that are not available with everyone should go in the right direction so, so that we don't make mistakes and make investment effective? Let's talk about that. I think that the very simple point is that this is a business proposition. It's very simple. If you go to a bank and say, I, I want some money to invest in a solar plant of some kind, whether it's wind or whatever, uh, you can 
and get a loan, you can get a return on that. You can get a return on that which will pay your loan back and make you a profit. <laughs> That's what the farmers near me are doing. That's all they're doing. They go to the bank Seconde, and borrow some money. Seconde, so, Arman, there's my simple point. Arman, Arman, is that easy to do? Companies uh, that uh, invest in RES would easily come to a bank and say, uh, give me some money for renewable energy and they'll get money and it will pay for itself. Well, right now in Kazakhstan, uh, it's one of the three key uh, programs uh, along with the uh, with the fixed tariffs. Uh, well, there's devaluation that hurt that, uh, but of course when your financing is mostly uh, from outside of the country in hard currency, but you collect your, uh, your fees for power in Tenge, uh, devaluation isn't working. But right now this role in Kazakhstan is being played by international financial institutions of development, uh, EBR, EBRD, Eurasian Development Bank. But, but is that business case? Uh, is that just is that just a grant, or are they are they going to collect their money? Yes, uh, this is a business case. Uh, we're going to pay them. Uh, first of all, working on reducing the costs of components for uh, for the panels themselves, for the converters, for the cable work, uh, and just as in the oil and gas industry, uh, we need to understand as with the Eurasia project, capexes are only going up, and that is uh, playing uh, for us because costs are going there. They're plummeting. A second point in Kazakhstan, the major international companies are coming, uh, uh, including uh, first of all Chinese. I'm not saying bad or good. It's just fine. And of course, we shouldn't forget about local businesses, uh, local SMEs. It was mentioned earlier. Do SMEs have any place? Kazakhstan is starting low. We're in the ninth position by land mass and only 17 and a half million population. But more than half still lives in the countryside, in rural areas. And some of such villages are quite remote. And for them, it's actually economically more effective, more reasonable to use hybrid uh, RES like in, they have in India, in Australia, for at least power needs for their refrigerator to charge up their phone or for water pumps uh, to pump water to irrigate your fields. And there are a lot of projects like that. Uh, we as association have approached our Minister of Energy and the suggestion was to consider a government a program for uh, green energy development after Expo. So that is not only a concept, but there's an actual program as they've done for the uh, rural, for the uh, agriculture industry, for many others, when certain funds in Tenge under uh, uh, conditional 5% interest, uh, and that will save such projects from devaluation. You don't have that money? Not yet. Okay, I understand you, please. I'm Harry Nanda from Toronto, Canada. Uh, Mr. Bijan rightly pointed that we have a lot of uh, wasteful uh, food. And uh, Mr. Moderator, you said, how can we bring a change in the lifestyle? I'll give you an example. In Toronto, we have a restaurant, all-you-can-eat buffet sushi, which is frequented by a lot of young students, especially university students. And a lot of food was going waste on the plates when they left. So the owner decided to change the model. He said, you can eat all you can, but whatever you leave, as a leftover, whatever you don't consume, I'm going to bill you extra for that. That brought a lot of change in the lifestyle of university students, and a lot of now restaurants have caught up to that model. Stimul, so, economic stimul. So economic incentive. Went to that restaurant and she got up that habit. Now she cooks less at the university, whatever she can consume. So I think a small step at it, it has started bringing the change. Secondly, Mr. Moderator, you pointed out and you questioned who is willing to invest in green economy? I believe there are a lot of institutions that, are, that have vision who will invest in green economy. Now remember, nobody wanted to invest in Facebook. The WhatsApp founder didn't have money to eat food. He was buying food, or food, getting food on food stamps. So imagine those banks who would have refused them financing at that moment. So one step at a small thing, it can bring a change. Thank you. Thank you very much. A wonderful, a brilliant comment. Please, you. Thank you. I'm David Applefield, I'm the commercial rep for the FT. But Mr. Moderator, your, um, the um, degree of aggressiveness and almost an antagonism and skepticism on uh, the green economy is uh, it's enlightening and interesting. It just tells me that journalists uh, around the world have a lot more um, work to do in educating and uh, disseminating positive examples. 
um, of the, because from a business point of view, your concerns seem to be primarily who's going to pay. But there are lots and lots of uh, very, uh, even larger examples than these very good ones, which are symbolic, but step by step. Uh, in the, uh, there's an organization called Sustainable Brands that brings together transportation, aviation, agriculture, supply chain, food, housing, packaging, textile, uh, uh, even cosmetic um, industry leaders who are, ch who are actually making very, very massive um, uh, tangible business uh, changes in their models. Uh, so, um, for example, and there's a, I also wanted to direct, direct your attention and those uh, who have not read uh, classic uh, William McDonald's Cradle to Cradle um, about sustainable design. Um, the designer um, and architect uh, McDonough built in India a, the world's largest motorcycle factory called Hero, which um, produces 120% of its own energy. So before the, it was built, um, there was an off-taker and the 20% of the energy was sold. The building also produces its own water, so it reduced, it reduced its cost. It produces its own, grows its own food on the roofs, et cetera, et cetera. So the building was, was uh, the cost, the capital expenditure of the building um, was, uh, was, was reduced. The burden for the bank and the financing for the, uh, for the project was much, uh, was reduced. And the building actually, we're not even talking yet about producing motorcycles. The building is profitable. There are lots and lots today of major corporations not only American, BASF, uh, um, uh, uh, DuPont, uh, um, um, UPS, uh, 3M Company, um, uh, P&G, uh, UPS, I said that already, PepsiCo, Cisco, that are really transforming their, their business models. So the point is, I think, and this is my question, I didn't really mean to uh, go on on this, but that uh, no. what can, and this to my question to the panelists, is that what should should the media be doing? This is a media forum. We're talking about communication. We have a communications problem because these stories are prevalent. This is the way the world is working. This is the way that the tendencies of the green, uh, the circular economy and the green, green economy are going to function in this region as well, in oil and gas um, uh, uh, supplying countries as well. What should journalists do? What should the media do? How can we communicate better in a, to, so that the kinds of questions that made sense a few years ago, the ones that you were raising, the skepticism that you were raising, that, made, that did make sense, that don't really make the same degree of sense today. They need спасибо, to be... Спасибо. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Question, the question was asked. Mr. Pachuri, why don't we start with you? I think about, uh, about the media. How, how should we work on that? Excellent point. Uh, I really think that the scientific community, academia, need to inform the media far more effectively than we've been doing in the past. And, uh, you know, there are some media people who are really with it. We've heard two of them, at least, right now. And just to answer your question on who's going to pay for this, India is, by and large, a poor country. The largest bank is now providing about a billion dollars for a solar rooftop program. I mean, they see these, this as good business. And the other thing that I think we should be cautious of is the fact that uh, in the earlier session they talked about reputational risk. Companies that don't do these things will go out of business as much because they're not making money as the fact that the public's going to say that these guys are against society. Let's accept that fact. And I think the sooner we change our attitudes, the better it would be. And I think we really need a massive education program, and I'm glad this issue has been raised because the media has such an influence on society, and they need to be with it. They have to be trained, they have to be informed, and I think the scientific community has to do a lot more in that regard. Wonderful. Uh, Natalia from, science, uh, from academic world. Well, I'm not an academic community, but I want to say in, uh, to what you said earlier about uh, Elon Musk and about different ideas of uh, resettling to another planet. I understand uh, it's probably something of the future, but for now I should say we have no other home but this planet. And let me emphasize that uh, uh, 
greenifying economy and switching to new approaches. It's a matter of survival. Money is not something uh, that you can eat. You should invest money into these things to survive and you can gradually move up. And we should also ask ourselves a question. Uh, don't deny uh, uh, climate change. We actually are very close to a point of no return. And I must say that it's very important to promote these positive examples that colleagues earlier mentioned. Uh, different people here because you know skepticism is present and exists in business uh, world uh, it makes business sense they're they're now transforming they count the uh, they look at the bottom line but uh, should think that if you don't do that it's not leading to positive of society and while some are just putting gold in coffins others uh, us do not have reliable power supply or not at all so we should move to more sustainable models of behavioral the consumption behavior and change our ways and it should the role of media is great here in informing the society the public so that we know how to how we should move forward thank you Ndali. Arman are you managing to uh, demonstrate your positive results yes uh, it's right it's a media forum we talk about information it's a fourth a real uh, branch of power and you can't uh, do such transformations w w such as green uh, uh, energy, green economy, uh, you can't do it without media. We should be informing the public that we need this for the economy, It's uh, we need this for the country, for future generations. We should always talk about uh, new things. I never want to uh, um, uh, should just uh, paint a bright culture. It didn't work for some countries like Spain or Germany. Germany at least 30%, 130 billion uh, euro. They think, do we need this or not? But at the same time, our people are smart, uh, highly educated, and they'll understand if they're properly informed. They will know who they should support green economy, uh, symbiotic development, along with uh, in symbiotic. Um, uh, ways with conventional energy and uh, not only con not only conventionally you mentioned not this three percent in England well you can only praise England for their achievement but uh, n not every country is going for that everyone's taking their own path of development we're not saying when we want to reach 50 percent as England we uh, would get there only by 2050 we have very strong traditional that should also be transformed through introduction of cutting-edge technology so every country has its own path and our population is very smart, highly educated, intelligent, and will support the right, the proper way for development. So summing up this uh, session, what can we say? Without green economy, further development of economic and political and environmental, as Natalia mentioned, uh, development will not happen. So everyone present here in this room, and not all this room, are voting with both hands for green economy. The main thing is to decide on your priorities. That's the main thing. Thank you very much, everyone from the audience, and I thank our panelists. A wonderful discussion. Let me once again introduce them. Natalia Alexeva, head of UNEP, uh, Rajendra Prashuri, uh, Nobel Peace Laureate. Uh, uh, greetings, Mr. Bashari. Once again, thank you very much. And Arman Kashkimbekov, General Director of uh, Association of Renewable Energy of Kazakhstan. Thank you very much.